All right. All right. How's everybody doing? Hotep A, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Wednesday, July 11th, 2018. We are live. Hope, hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so I wanted to broadcast earlier, but uh, I was tied up. And um, I'm getting ready to head to Atlanta for the Black Homeschooling Conference this weekend, Friday, July 13th through Sunday, July 15th, uh, in Atlanta at the Piedmont Technical Center, okay? So visit liberatedmindsexpo.com, liberatedmindsexpo.com for more information. So this morning I saw this story dealing with um, uh, African-American farmers in Memphis, Tennessee, and their claims that they were sold uh, fake uh, seeds, fake soybean seeds, or bad soybean seeds, and they were sold this on purpose, okay? And uh, they're claiming that uh, this is all designed to uh, cause them to lose their land also, all right? So this is a very deep story. I first saw the article early this morning from rawstory.com, okay, because I monitor a number of different news sources daily. So I saw this story from rawstory.com and also atlantablackstar.com uh, has it as well. And then I know today on um, uh, Keeping It Real with Reverend Al Sharpton, one of the callers called in and talked about this story also. And this also ties into uh, the uh, lawsuit that the black farmers filed against the U.S. government. And it was President Obama who actually paid out on that lawsuit. Nobody wants to talk about that. Uh, a few years ago, but also there's a history of African Americans losing land. I mean, we went from owning uh, 15 million acres of land um, to uh, owning less than two million acres of land today, and uh, majority of uh, majority of that land was farmland. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. All right, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Then also I want to let you know we have one more day left in our special promotion for African-American business owners. Uh, buy one month, get one month free. You can advertise with the African History Network, reach thousands of uh, uh, potential customers, okay? Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. That's going to expire uh, Thursday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, July 12th. OK, uh, you can take your business to the next level. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information. So when we look at the article from, uh, black, uh, from RawStory.com, black farmers were deliberately sold fake seeds and scheme to steal their land. OK, black farmers were deliberately sold fake seeds and scheme to steal their land report. And uh, they. Um, uh, interviewed, uh, they, they picked up the story from a, a local news source, WMEC News Channel 5, okay, uh, and then also um, there was another new local news source as well. But they interviewed Thomas Burrell. Now, Thomas Burrell is the president of the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association, all right, and uh, African-American farmers in the Mid-South region surrounding Memphis, Tennessee, used science, used science to uncover a multi-million dollar scheme to put them out of business and steal their farmland. This story was reported uh, by WMEC, I think it's Channel 5 News, on Tuesday, July 10th, 2018. Now, at the Mid-South uh, Farm and Gin Show, G-I-N, Gin Show, in March of 2017, African-American farmers believe that the Stein Seed Company, S-T-I-N-E, the Stein Seed Company, purpose, purposefully sold them fake seeds. They believe this was deliberate. This was on purpose. Now, Thomas Burrell, who's the president of the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association, explained how African-American farmers were receiving one-tenth, one-tenth of the yield as their white neighbors or one tenth of the uh, crops that are that are grown from these seeds, from these seeds. So he said, Mother Nature does not discriminate. It doesn't rain on white farms, but not black farms. Insects don't only attack black farmers' land, 
Why is it then that white farmers are buying Stein seed from that from the uh, from the Stein seed company? Okay, why is it that white farmers are buying Stein seed and their yield is 60, 70, 80, and 100 bushels of soybeans? And black farmers who are using the exact same equipment with the exact same land, all of a sudden, your seeds are coming up five, six, and seven bushels. So this is the question he asked. This is not like they just started, these African-American farmers just started growing soybeans. No, they have a history of doing this. Now, the results were so stark such a stark difference in what they, in the yield they were getting from the soybeans, they were buying from the Stein Seed Company, okay? The, the results were so stark, resulting in millions of dollars in losses that, the, the, that these African-American farmers took their seeds for scientific testing by experts at Mississippi State University. They took their seeds for expert testing at Mississippi State University scientific testing. So the tests reveal that the African-American farmers had not been given the quality certified, quote unquote, certified Stein seeds for which they had paid for. They were given something other than what they paid for. Now, Thomas Burrell, who's the president of the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association, suggested a land grab was the ultimate motivation of the perpetrators a massive land grab. They're going after these farmers' land. Okay, now it's only about 45,000 or, or less than 45,000 uh, African-American farmers today. Okay, now in 1930, uh, well, if we go back to 1925, about 1925, there were, or 1920, there were about 920,000 African-American owned farms. 925,000 African-American owned farms in 1920. The numbers I've seen from 1930, it's about 900,000. If you read How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, they talk about the theft of land in here. This is from the Nation of Islam Research Group. It's very well put together, very well documented. Uh, this is the third edition. Any of the editions are good. This is the second edition with Donald Sterling on the cover, former owner of the LA Clippers, okay? I have all three editions. This is the latest edition. Uh, they talk about the massive land grab, all right? And uh, they, they deal with how in 1930, uh, they talk about how during the Great Depression, uh, so many African American uh, farmers lost their land, okay? And on page 73, uh, they say, as a result, Black-owned farms unable to compete with the well-subsidized and well-financed white farms fell dramatically from about 900,000 in 1930 to 682,000 in 1939. Now, this is as a result of a Farmers Home Administration, the FHA, okay? All this deals with policy. All this deals with politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement, all right? Voting is only one aspect of politics. Politics impacts every aspect of your life, from the water you drink, to the air you breathe, to the food you eat. So this is during the Great Depression, 1930, 1939, Great Depression era. They, they're talking about the Farmers Home Administration, the FHA, which is one of these entities that come out of the, uh, basically come out of the New Deal. The Farmers Home Administration was set up in 1930 to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operations. The stock market crashes in 1929, which starts the Great Depression. These farmers, they, they, they set up the Farmer Home Administration, right, to give low interest loans to white farmers so they can stay in business, pay the mortgages on their farms, you know, pay their uh, employees, right? And mechanize their farms so they can become more efficient. Now to achieve this unstated, to, to achieve this unstated racist, to achieve this unstated racist purpose of the Farmers Home Administration, um, the FHA allowed local whites to operate the program and they, and, 
and they, not the federal government, decided who would get the critical benefits. So this, so the, for, so the funds almost exclusively went to white farmers so they can keep their farms. But we didn't get those loans. So we lost hundreds of thousands of our farms. We lost millions of acres of land during the Great Depression. So as a result, black-owned farms unable to compete with the well-subsidized and well-financed white farms fell dramatically from about 900,000 in 1930 to 682,000 in, in 1939. Many of the white farmers used the government money to modernize by buying tractors and evicting black sharecroppers. So even though sharecropping was an undesirable condition for African-Americans, it's even worse for you to be a sharecropper during the Great Depression and lose your job as a sharecropper. Because when these white farmers are giving these loans, they can buy tractors, they can mechanize their farms, they're getting rid of black sharecroppers during the Great Depression. Now, many of the whites use the government money to modernize by buying tractors and evicting black sharecroppers. The U.S. Congress amended the law to say that half the money should go to those tenant farmers, those tenant farmers like sharecroppers, but the white landholders simply stole the farmers' payments, claiming if they were asked that debts were owed. So they say, well, Joe owes, he owes last year, last year's crop wasn't that good. We loaned him the feed, he stayed here, he, owned, he owes for that. So we're gonna take this money coming from the government instead of giving it to Joe so he can go buy his own farm. No, he owes us money, so, and, and, and we keep the books also. So Joe doesn't even know, Joe doesn't even have the books. Joe isn't giving access to the books. We keep the books, we tell him what he owes. And no, Joe, you're in debt. So we're gonna take this money right here and we're gonna, put it in our pockets, all right? This is what happened. Read pages 72 and 73 of How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, okay? So when you look at what's taking place right now, this, this article came out today and yesterday, okay? The, you know, um, Dr. John Henry Clark taught us that all history is a current event. Everything that's ever happened continues to happen in some shape, form, or fashion. All right? So when we go back to this article from rawstory.com, and then you should check out this other article that I'm going to come to in just a minute. African Americans have lost untold acres of land over the last century. This is from June 26, 2017, last year, from the nation.com. Okay, this deals with how we lost about 14 million acres of land through various ways, a lot, of, a lot of it very deceptive. Some of, some of us were run off of our lands by white terrorism in the South, okay? All right, so if we, if we go back to what this, this story that came out today from rawstory.com, the, the tests reveal that these African-American farmers had not been given the quality, quote unquote, certified Stein seeds Stein seeds for which they paid, okay? And they bought soybean seeds from the Stein Seed Company, all right? So uh, it goes on to say, quote, all we have to do is look at here. 80 years ago, you had 1 million black farmers. Today, you have less than 5,000, okay? 80 years ago, this is Tom Burrell, who is the president of the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association. See, this is a whole part of history that's not talked about. And the civil rights movement did not correct this. Now, Dr. King was trying to address this with the Poor People's Campaign. He was trying to address this with the Poor People's Campaign, but he was assassinated while the Poor People's Campaign was going on, April 4th, 1968. So if he didn't make it to Washington, D.C. They were taking this fight all the way to Washington, D.C. They ended up uh, at wa in Washington, D.C., June 19th, Juneteenth of 1968. So this is two months after Dr. King was assassinated. So Thomas, Thomas Burrell said, all we have to do is look, okay? 80 years ago, you had 1 million black farmers. Today, you have less than 5,000 African-American farmers. These individuals did not buy 60 million acres of land just to, just to uh, uh, let it lay idle, okay? The sons and daughters, the heirs of African-American farmers or black farmers want to farm just like the sons and daughters of white farmers. He goes on to say, so we have to acknowledge that racism is the motivation here. 
Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism is a power structure which comes out of the ideology of white supremacy. Racism has nothing to do with calling people racial epithets, calling people the N-word and things like that. That's bigotry. That's not racism. Racism is a power structure. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of white supremacy. The Farmers Home Administration created in 1930, which gave low interest loans to white farmers and not to African American farmers, so white farmers can mechanize their farms and keep their farms and we end up losing our, ours. That comes out of racism. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, pri privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, uh, wealth, uh, media, et cetera, access to jobs, and they use that to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. That's what racism is. That's a power structure which, come, which comes out of the ideology of white supremacy. This ideology is going to emerge in the late 1400s, early 1500s, as Europeans start to circumnavigate the globe, and they operate based upon manifest destiny, based upon the ideology that European culture is superior to other people's culture. And because of manifest destiny, this gives them the right, that their God-given right, the authority from God, that they can go and conquer other people's land, take control of other people's land and natural resources, subordinate and enslave other people. And as they start to circumnavigate the globe, they realize the majority of the world is non-European. And as they intermix with these cultures, as these white men have sex with these various women of different ethnicities, and that child is born, they realize that child is no longer white. And they realize that they do not put something in place, a, a, a system in place to preserve genetic white survival, they realize they can be wiped off the face of the earth. This is after the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who go on in 711 AD from Morocco. They go from North, uh, North Africa. They go from Morocco. They're going from West Africa. And you have, uh, you have waves of these African men known as the Moors, largely because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be largely African men initially. And they're going to intermix with the European population, intermix with white women. And they see when that child is born, that child is no longer white. So they would, Europeans were dealing with the Moors for about 800 years, right? Be, uh, and then when they really start circumnavigating the globe, they see that the majority of the world is non-European. And they start putting these systems in place. And one of the people who, who helps to really spread racism or, the, or what we would later call racism is going to be Cristobal Colon, or who we call Christopher Columbus who set sail August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina de Penta in Santa Maria. So we have to understand, so, so, so as, as Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene teaches us, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, who's one of my teachers, you've seen or heard a lot of my interviews with him. He's in the Hidden Colors documentary, he's wearing the Black Friday documentaries together and Elementary Genocide 3 from uh, director uh, Raheem Shabazz, and shout out to Rick Mathis, creator of the Black Friday series. Professor Kaba Kamene talks about how to understand the existence of something, you first must understand the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you first must understand the pre-existence of existence, okay? All right, so if we look at, uh, go back to this article from uh, rawstory.com, black farmers were deliberately sold fake seeds in scheme to steal their land, report. Now, rawstory.com is a white publication and they're telling you this. RawStory.com is a white publication. They have a lot of good articles. This is, uh, this is one of the 35 news sources I look at on a daily basis. All right, so um, it, it goes on to say, the farmers have filed, these African-American farmers have filed a class action lawsuit in United States District Court for the Western Division in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. Now, a state, legis a state legislator is also seeking an investigation into this scheme. This scheme to sell these quote unquote allegedly fake soybean seeds. Tennessee Representative G.A. Hardaway, G.A. Hardaway, Democrat from Memphis, vowed state government would vow that the state government would investigate quote unquote issues which have negatively impacted our black farmers, end quote. Okay, Representative Hardaway went on to say we would explore the avenues where it's civil. Whether it's, crim whether it's civil, whether it's criminal, whether it's a civil case or whether this is a criminal case, okay? Dealing with fraud, 
Now, one former, uh, one farmer who was victimized is named David Hall. And David Hall explained why he had paid extra for high quality seeds, okay? These high quality soybean seeds. Uh, David Hall said, we bought nearly $90,000 worth of seed. It's been known to produce high yield, so you expect it when you pay the money for it to produce the high yields, okay? Okay, he said it's been known to produce high yields. That means to produce a large amount of crops, okay, from these seeds. He says, so you expect it when you pay the money for it to produce high yield. So he's saying, well, hey, you get what you pay for. So we want the higher quality seeds so we can get more bushels from it, so we can sell more, so we can make more money, more revenue, more profit. Now, Thomas Burrell, who is the president of the Black Farmers and Agricultural Association, he said, uh, no matter, he said, no matter much rain Mother Nature gives you, if the germination is zero, the seed is impotent. He's basically saying, no matter how much rain Mother Nature gives you, if the germination is zero, if the seed is no good, then, you know, if the, the germination is zero, then the seed is impotent. Now, in a statement released from the Stein Seed Company, this is who they are suing, Myron Stein uh, said, quote, the lawsuit against Stein Seed Company is without merit and factually unsupportable. Stein takes seriously any allegations of unlawful, improper, or discriminatory conduct and is disturbed by the baseless allegations leveled against the company. Upon, upon learning of these claims, the company took swift action to conduct an internal investigation, which has not revealed any evidence that would support these allegations. Stein intends, Stein C Company intends to vigorously defend itself against this meritless lawsuit and has filed a motion to dismiss. Our, our focus is on continuing to serve all of our customers with the highest degree of integrity and respect that are the bedrock of our values, end quote. Okay, now this is a statement from Myron Stein, S-T-I-N-E, of the Stein Seed Company. This is who these African-American farmers are suing, all right? Uh, check out this article from, um, rawstory.com it's a really good article and you can look at the source articles uh like coming from uh, the local the local news sources uh like wmec okay wmec all right how's everybody doing i want to go to the other article from atlantablackstar.com about the same story and uh i want to let you all know email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, African American business owners, because we have one more day of our special promotion. Uh, we can advertise with the African History Network and buy one month, get one month free. You put your 30 second to 60 second commercial in the podcast of our radio shows. And if you don't have a commercial, we can record one for you. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information about that. And also, if you're an African American business owner, you can list the name of your business here on the thread of our broadcast. We'll shout you out also. Now, the article about this same story from AtlantaBlackStar.com is called Black Memphis Farmers Were Deliberately Sold Bad Seed and Scheme to Put Them Out of Business. Okay, this is by Tanasia, Tanasia Kenny, uh, uh, Wednesday, July 11, 2018. All right, and um, they have some of the same information in here as well. So check out this um, check out this article also. All right, now if we look at some of the history of African American farmers losing our land, there was an article from June 30th of 2017 from AtlantaBlackStar.com. This is a fantastic, fantastic news website for news pertaining to the African American community. From 15 million acres to 1 million how black people lost their land from 15 million acres to 1 million, how black people lost their land. And in this article from uh, David Love, this article was picked up from the article from June 26, 2017 from the nation.com called African Americans have lost untold acres of land over the last century. But uh, in this article, they talk about how at its height, 
black owned black land ownership was impressive at the turn of the, at the turn of the 20th century okay so we're looking at the early 1900s formerly enslaved african americans and their heirs owned 15 million acres of land primarily in the south mostly used for farming in 1920 the 925,000 african american farms represented 14% of the farms in the U.S. Sadly, things turned for the worse as 600,000 African-American farmers were forced off their land with only 45,000 African-American farms remaining in 1975. So you go from 925,000 African-American owned farms in 1920 to only 45,000 African-American farms in 1975. Okay, over that 55 year period of time, you have over 800,000 farms basically lost. Now, African Americans are only 1% of rural land owners in the US and under 2% of farmers. Of the 1 billion acres of, of arable land in America, um, African Americans today own a little more than one million acres, according to the Associated Press. Now, during the Obama administration, the U.S. Department of Agriculture settled with African American farmers for $2.3 billion for their long standing claims of discrimination in farm loans and other government programs. Okay, that goes back to 1930 and the Farmers Home Administration, which we talked about, that they talk about in this book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, okay? Uh, and the Farmers Home Administration was created in 1930, and it was set up to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operations. This is the year after the Great Depression starts in 1929. Now, over the years, African Americans have lost their land through a number of circumstances, including government action, deception, and a reign of domestic terror in the South that forced African Americans from their homes through threats of violence and lynching. Okay, we saw, even though it's not in the South, Omaha, Nebraska, we saw Malcolm X's family. We saw them ran off their land in Omaha, Nebraska, and they owned a farm there. Okay, by the Black Legion or, or Ku Klux Klan like group. Okay, and we know if you look at the um, a few months ago, you had the uh, lynching memorial uh, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, in the lynching museum that was open from the Equal Justice Initiative. And they talk about the racial terror inflicted upon African Americans from 1877 to 1950. And you had over 4,000 lynchings that took place and all except 300 of them took place in the South. So there's a, and, and, and when you uh, listen to interviews of, of Brian Stevenson, who's the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, when they were talking about the opening of the museum, uh, he talked about how there was a, a wave of racial terror that ran, ran many African-Americans off of their land. There's a history, and then their land was confiscated by, by white people. Now, the terror and economic exploitation, uh, this terror and economic exploitation precipitated the Great Migration, which resulted in the uprooting of over 6 million African, -American, African Americans from the South and their relocation in the North, Midwest, and the West between 1960, 1916 and 1970. So some sources show 5 million African Americans uh, um, migrating during the Great Migration. Some show six million. Usually it's from about 1915 and 1970. And it's largely precipitated. Uh, the, 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 big, the real big catalyst of it was World War I. Yes, you have the auto industry and, and uh, Henry Ford. And you're gonna have some migrating before then, okay? Because Henry Ford um, uh, sets up, uh, I think he starts making cars around 1908 in Highland Park, Michigan, with the Ford Motor Company. But um, World War I, what happens is, is you have five million men who go away and fight in a war, almost all of them white, and this leaves a labor vacuum in factories. This leaves, a, this leaves a huge amount of job openings. 
So you have factories up north and, and corporations up north who are marketing to African Americans in the south saying, come up here because they need labor. Okay. So, so you had a lot of African Americans leaving the south, some sharecroppers, some farm owners, what have you, uh, whatever it is, domestics, farmers, tenant farmers, what have you, what have you. But you have a lot of them leaving the south, going up north to work in the factories. So, so the great migration, we lose millions of acres of land. Some of, some of them are leaving on their own. Some are ran out of the South because of terrorism. They say, well, look, we're going to go work in the factory. But they're looking. They, wanna, they want home ownership. You know, they want a fair mortgage. They want home ownership. They're looking for equal protection under the law also. And they are escaping Jim Crow laws. They, they are escaping the lynchings taking place. They are white terrorism. Okay, so uh, the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com goes on to say, how we lost the land is an untold story. An investigation by the AP Associated Press documented the process by which people were tricked or, in, or, or uh, uh, intimated out of their property, okay? I'm not sure if you meant to say intimidated, okay? Uh, in this study of 107 land takings, 107 land takings or thefts in 13 southern and border states, 406 landowners lost over 24,000 acres of land uh, of their farm, or over 24,000 acres of farm and timberland, and 85, not the wrapper, but timberland, two words, okay, and, 80, <laughs> and 85 properties such lots and stores, okay? So it wasn't just, wasn't just farmland. You know, you had a lot of African-American business owners also. We lost that land as well. Now, the property which today is owned by white people and corporations is valued in the tens of millions of dollars. In recent years, groups such as the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Atlanta and the Land Loss Prevention Project in Durham, North Carolina, receive new reports of land takings or land thefts on a regular basis, while the Penn Center, P-E-N, Penn Center in St. Helena Island, South Carolina, has gathered 2,000 such cases. One story from the Associated Press provides the context by which families lost their land to thievery and violence to thievery and violence. So if you um, uh, check out the article, I'm gonna pull up this article from, uh, uh, you know, I talked about when the uh, lynching museum opened. See, all these historical events are connected. You, you, you have to understand how a sequence of historical events lead up to other events taking place. Historical events don't take place in a vacuum. This is why we have to understand history. P policies are put into place to address conditions. The, the policies address conditions, then uh, the new policies put into place have side effects. Uh, and then policies are put into place to address, address the side effects of the conditions created by policies. So you have to understand how this is cyclical as well. This is one of the reasons why the NAACP was formed in 1909 to fight against the rampant lynchings that were taking place. They were trying to fight for um, a federal anti-lynching law, okay, that they never got. So when you have the silent march of uh, 1917, you have about 11,000 African Americans marching, I think it was in New York, the silent march, they're, they're fighting for uh, a federal anti-lynching law and this took place after the East St. Louis race riot of, of 1917. The East St. Louis, we researched that. I, I did a, a presentation on that before. Uh, the East St. A broadcast on that. The East St. Louis race riot of 1917. Okay? And when you look at the NAACP, they're formed. We know about the Niagara Movement formed in 1905. But they're, they're formed after the Springfield, Illinois race riot of 1908. And this is one of the, um, this is one of the uh, um, at that time, one of the rare race rides in the North, okay, at that time. Uh, now, the, here's the other thing. As you have, uh, because of the Great Migration, and you have more African Americans migrating from the South up North, you're going to have an increase in race rides take place in the North also. 
Yes. And if you read uh, before the Mayflower, before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. And you look at the back of uh, the before the Mayflower, he gives a chronology of history going back to about 1619 year by year. And you can see during the Great Migration and as you go into the 20s and 30s and 40s, you can see an increase in the number of uh, race rides and things like this that take place in the north. As more African-Americans move up north, it, it, you have an increase, you have a, um, a greater competition for jobs, you have more pressure put on um, uh, social services, government services, more competition for housing, things like this. You have an increase in racial incidences, uh, race rides, et cetera, that take place uh, as a result of the Great Migration. Okay, and they're going to migrate up north and then also out west, out like California, go to Los Angeles and Oakland, California, things like this, right? Okay, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in. How you like this type of information? Okay, see, this, this all deals with history. History is impacted by economics, history is impacted by politics, and your history and culture gives you your values, your interests, and your principles, your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles, and influences your economic empowerment and political empowerment. You have to have a synthesis of all three. It's not one or the other. You have to have a synthesis of all three, okay? All right, now if you like this type of information, be sure to register for the online courses that I teach also. They're all on demand. We have a bundle pack, a 10 in the bundle pack. They're on sale, $60, regularly $130, and they include Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, which is a 14-hour, seven-session online course that uh, I teach. It's all on demand. Uh, we deal with thousands of years of history, okay? And you can also register for that. We just posted a link here, but you can also register at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And those that are African-American business owners, uh, we have one day, one more day left in our special promotion where you can advertise with the African History Network, reach thousands of uh, potential uh, customers. Um, buy one month, get one month free, okay? Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information and we can get you started today in that. We put uh, uh, your commercial, your 60 second commercial into the audio podcast of our radio shows and they're on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes and CastBox. On Blog Talk alone, we get between 4,000 to 8,000 listens per episode within, within about one to two weeks. Um, and we have some other things for you as well. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information. I have six uh, advertising slots left because I only have a certain number of inventory. So I have six advertising slots left. So email us uh, to like now. Okay, uh, let's continue here. All right, so this article from June of 2017 from the nation.com, and the nation has some really, really good articles. They had a good series of articles dealing with uh, voter suppression that was taking place during the 2016 election cycle. African Americans have lost untold acres of land over the last century, an obscure legal loophole is often to blame, okay? And what is politics? Politics deals with law. The legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And one of the biggest problems that we have is, one, we don't understand history. Two, we don't understand law. All right? And uh, this was the uh, basically the source article of for the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com written by David A. Love um, entitled... Uh, from 15 million acres to 1 million, how black people lost their land. This is real history, okay? So, um, he, he talks about how one story from the Associated Press provides the context by which families, African-American families, lost their land to thievery and violence, all right? And I'm gonna go to that, and I, I wanna uh, bring up the uh, article about the lynching memorial, lynching museum. I want you to check this out as well, okay? Because people think all oh, this is in the past. No, no, the, the, the past, the, the, the events of the past help to shape the present and the future, okay? Um, there's one article here, I think this is Huffington Post Black Voices. Uh, let me see, is this one of them here? Let's see. 
there's one uh, New York Times history of lynchings in the in the South documents nearly 4,000 names. Okay, I think that's one of them. All right, because there was a report from the Equal Justice Initiative from a few years ago that talked about how, based upon their research, they discovered uh, about 4,000 um, lynchings that took place from 1877 to 1850, and most of them, uh, most of these lynchings we didn't know about. Okay, now this is from 2015. It's still a good article, and uh, this I think this deals with the Equal Justice Initiative. Also, this is called um, "History of Lynchings in the South." Documents nearly 4,000 names. History of lynchings in the South documents nearly 4,000 names. And what the lynching museum was doing was memorializing these victims of the lynchings then they were they had their names there uh brief information about their their the, the story of what happened to them things like this okay uh let me see and let me try to pull up one on the lynching museum And we'll go back to this. Okay, yeah, here we go here. Yeah, lynching didn't disappear, it just evolved. Lynching didn't disappear, it just evolved. A.T. McWilliams, this is for uh, HuffingtonPost.com. And they talk about while visiting the newly opened National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, a hallowed and harrowing enshrinement bearing the names of over 4,000 black people lynched in the Jim Crow South. I was reminded of the stories my grandparents told me as a child, okay? Uh, stories of my great grandfather once chased by Ku Klux Klan members on horseback before swimming to safety, preferring possible death by drowning to murder by his countrymen. Stories of my great grandmother, whose white partner was burned alive in his home for loving a black woman. Stories of uniquely American terrorism, seldom told and rarely reconciled, okay? But with this new memorial and its complimentary legacy museum, the Equal Justice Initiative, which built them, built the memorial and the museum, may finally achieve reconciliation for such racial terror by recognizing the lives lost to lynching and illustrating slavery's evolution through the accounts of its victims, both past and present. The Equal Justice Initiative teaches us how storytelling can be used to acknowledge America's violent past and heal slavery's longstanding wounds, okay? You can read the rest of this. This is uh, uh, HuffingtonPost.com, maybe Huffington Post Black Voices. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll post a link here. We'll post a link here so you can check this out, okay? Because this all deals with history, and this all deals today with uh, what we're dealing with today. And unfortunately, most African Americans don't understand this history, and most white people don't understand it either. So we operate out of ignorance, or we operate out of a bunch of myths and stereotypes, which are based upon ignorance, okay? When people don't have the factual information, then uh, lies and stereotypes are allowed to persist. Okay, so let's post this here. All right. Okay, how's everybody doing? All right, so if we go back to the article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com, uh, from 15 million acres to 1 million, how black people lost uh, their land. And if you're an African-American business owner, go ahead and uh, you can post the uh, name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll give you a shout out. Be sure to email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com so we can get you some information about advertising with us. You can take advantage of our uh, special promotion, buy one month, get one month free. All right, so, for the, okay, here we go. All right, so uh, here's a story. Uh, one story from the Associated Press provides the context by which families lost their land to thievery and violence. So after midnight on October 4th, 1908, October 4th, 1908, 50 hooded white men surrounded the home of a black farmer in Hickman, Kentucky, and ordered him to come out for a whipping. When David Walker refused, and shot at them uh, instead. The mob poured coal, coal, oil, coal, oil 
on his house and set it afire, according to contemporary newspaper accounts. Pleading for mercy, uh, David Walker ran out the front door, followed by four screaming children and his wife carrying a baby in her arms. The mob shot them all, wounding three children and killing the others. Okay, the mob shot them all, wounding three children and killing the others. David Walker's oldest son never escaped the burning house. No one was ever charged with the killings and the surviving children were deprived of the farm their father died defending. The, uh, the surviving children were deprived of the farm their father died defending. Land records show that David Walker's two, eight, two and a half acre farm was simply folded into the property of a white neighbor. Land records show that David Walker's two and a half acre farm was simply folded into the property of a white neighbor. The neighbor soon, the neighbor soon sold it to another man, probably white, whose daughter owns the undeveloped land today. There's a history, there's a history of racial terrorism in the South, taking, killing African Americans, taking their land, or running them off of their land and, and them fleeing, going up north, going somewhere else, fleeing racial terrorism. So land is among, so the article goes on to say, land is among the most important assets people can own. And this is why ownership of land for formerly enslaved Africans was so important after the Civil War ended. So this is why when you have organizations dealing with suing for reparations, they need to understand law first to do this properly because many of them unfortunately don't. But this is what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the theft of land, but also we're dealing with how the U.S. government violated its own laws because as of January 1st, 1808, the importation of African people as slaves was prohibited because of a bill that passed Congress March 2nd, 1807, that prohibited the importation of enslaved Africans. And that went to effect January 1st, 1808. So when they continue to bring Africans into this country as slaves, starting in January 1st, 1808, they violated their own laws. Now you have a legal argument. Prior to that, you really don't have a legal argument because it was legal to enslave Africans. It was legal to bring them in. And you don't go to a legal court to make a moral argument. You go to a legal court to make a legal argument. You don't go to a legal court to say how wrong and immoral something was. You go to a legal court to make a legal argument. Okay, so check out the article from Dr. Jahi Issa and Brother Reggie Marbury at, uh, uh, they, they, they wrote an article um, dealing with uh, slavery is dead, here's how to revive it or something like that, Slavery's Dead, just Google that. Dr. Jahi Issa, J-A-H-I, and uh, Reggie Marbury, okay? Because I interviewed them uh, before and we went in depth and broke, broke down that history, okay? All right. Okay, so who we have here? We got Lonnie, we've got um, Sharon, okay, or Sharon. Uh, Davis, okay, said facts. Kim, okay, how you doing, Kim? Brother Abdul in Detroit, how you doing, Abdul? Abdul Akil. All right, so land is among the most important assets people can own, certainly for the rural society in which many African Americans traditionally have lived. Land represented prosperity, intergenerational wealth, family, and community. According to the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, land can be a vital part of cultural and social identities, a valuable asset to stimulate economic growth and a central component to preserving natural resources and building societies that are inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, end quote. All right, um, let's see here. Okay, so when we deal with policies and we are pushing political agendas and we deal with policies, 
we have to be pushing policies that address this theft of land. We have to deal with policies that address this theft of land. This is this was wealth that was stolen. Okay, this was wealth that was stolen. Um, let me see here. Uh, and uh, let me see. There was something here in the article from uh, the Nation.com. I wanted to highlight. Oh yeah. Okay. So the article from the Nation.com is entitled, this was the source article from the one from Atlanta Black Star. African Americans have lost untold acres of land over the last century. And this is from June 26, 2017. So you see, this ties right into the story of the black farmers that came out yesterday and today. This ties right into that story. Um, it talks about how, uh, okay, so, it says as the as uh, they they give they tell the story of um, Matthew Allen, okay Matthew Allen, who is uh, now in his seventies, okay Matthew Allen grew up visiting uh, uh, his family's land where his father and grandfather grew up, okay he said when my father was coming up, uh, they used to go down to to the water to fish. They used to hunt, they used to farm the land, used to grow okra, corn, sweet potatoes. They took full advantage of the land, okay? Um, now, it was Dennis Allen, Dennis Allen, who was Matthew Allen's great-grandfather, who purchased the land on Hilton Head, okay? Hilton Head. And that's in, uh, I think that's South Carolina. Okay. But uh, yeah, uh, Rhodes Hilton Head. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, so the son of slaves, Dennis Dennis Allen, who was Matthew's great grandfather, the son of slaves, Dennis Allen, bought his first par parcel of land, nearly twenty acres, in 1897. 1897. Okay. So this is less than, this is uh, 22 years after slavery ends in 1865. Now this is at a time when African-Americans were purchasing land across the country, all right? Because even though many of us were sharecroppers, things like this, a lot of us were gonna be able to purchase land, earn some money, purchase land, okay? Now today, the Allen family owns the largest undeveloped lot on Hilton Head. But as the land enters its 120th year in the family, and you got a whole lot of white families that have land that was handed down generation after generation because of things like the Homestead Act of 1862, okay, during the second year of the Civil War, which gave, which, which redistributed 250 million acres of land. And this was probably the, probably one of the biggest land giveaways in the history of this country and they gave away land for over a hundred years. The last claim was filed in 1976 based upon the Homestead Act of 1862. The last allotment was, was um, given out in 1988. Um, 80 acres of land in Alaska. Go to history.com, history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, search for the Homestead Act, and they break down its history. And African Americans were almost exclusively locked out. 99.9% .9 of this land went to white people. All right. And white peasants coming to this country also, white immigrants coming to this country. And this land, we were locked out of this land giveaway after we were the ones who plowed the land and took care of the land for 246 years for free, largely during slavery. So, um, So today the Allen family owns the largest undeveloped lot of land in Hilton Head, okay? But as the land enters its 120th year in, in the family, the Allens are struggling to hold on to this land because of uh, ambiguities surrounding the land's title, because of ambiguities surrounding the land's title. Okay, this deals with law. There is no primary owner of the property. All of the heirs, of, of the original owners, all of the, 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 the heirs, those who were left something in the will, okay, an inheritance, 
all of the heirs of the uh, original owners, and there are more than 100 known heirs, these are all legally co-owners, okay? As such, the land is classified as quote unquote heirs property, heirs property. And this is a designation that makes it vulnerable to being sold without the family's full consent. So because of this legal loophole, the family's land can be sold without the full consent of these um, legally of these legal co-owners. So as the Allens attempt to overcome a stacked legal system, exacerbated by corrupt lawyers and predatory developers, they are at the center of decades long of a decades long fight to retain black owned land across the South. Now, in the 45 years following the Civil War, which officially ends June 2nd, 1865, freed slaves and their descendants accumulated roughly 15 million acres of land across the United States. Most of this land was in the South because this is where the majority of us were because of, <laughs> because of slavery. So land ownership meant stability and, and, and opportunity for African-American families. This gave a shot uh, at upward mobility and economic security for future generations. And even though, and, and even though, even if you were a farmer and you were poor, right, you could grow your own food. That's different than living up north and working in a factory or working in a store or being up, up north working somewhere and you don't own land, you can't grow your own food. So, and then also, even if you grew something, if there was other, um, if there was other type of crops or something that you didn't have, if you grew some crops, you could barter, you could exchange something that you grow with another black farmer and you can make it that way also. So land ownership meant stability and opportunity for black families, a shot at upward mobility and economic security for future generations. The hard won property, the hard one property was generally used for farming, the prop, which was the primary occupation of most Southern African Americans in the early 20th century, in the early 1900s. By 1920, as we already said, there were 925,000 black owned farms, representing about 14% of all farms in the United States. Over the course of the 20th century, however, the number, that number dropped, uh, and millions of farmers of all races, millions of farmers of all races were pushed off their land in the early part of the 20th century, including around 600,000 African-American farmers. And by 1975, just 45,000 African-American farms remained. Now, Pete Daniel is a scholar and is the author of the book called Dispossession, Dispossession discrimination against African-American farmers in the age of civil rights, discrimination against African-American farmers in the age of civil rights. He said, quote, it was almost as if the earth was opening up and swallowing black farmers. It was almost as if the earth was opening up and swallowing black farmers. Now implicit in the decline of African-American farming and farmers was the loss of the land those farmers once tilled or those farmers once owned. Today, African-Americans compose less than 2% of the nation's farmers and only 1% of its rural land owners. You have a theft of about 14 million acres of land or so. Many factors contributed to the loss of black owned land during the 20th century, including system, systemic discrimination in lending by the US Department of Agriculture. That's the Farmers Home Administration set up in 1930. You gotta get this book, How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. You can order this, this is put out by the Nation of Islam. You can order this from uh, NOI.org or uh, checkfinalcall.com and check your local African American uh, bookstore owner as well, okay? Many factors contributed to the loss of black, uh, of black owned land during the 20th century, including systemic discrimination in lending by the US Department of Agriculture, the industrialization that lured workers into factories, okay, like I talked about, 
and the Great Migration. That, that happened largely during the Great Migration, African Americans being lured out of the South uh, and going up North. And some of this, I'm not blaming so that I can understand this. You being ran out, you being terrorized by a Ku Klux Klan and Ku Klux Klan-like groups, you know, yeah, I can understand them wanting to get one to leave and go up north. The industrialization that lured workers into factories and the Great Migration, but the lesser known issue of heirs' property also played a role, allowing untold thousands of acres of land to be forcibly bought out from under black rural families, often second, third, or fourth generation landowners whose ancestors were enslaved, this land is taken by real estate developers and speculators. By one estimate, 81% of these early African-American landowners did not make wheels. By one estimate, 81% of these early African-American landowners did not make a wheel largely due to a lack of access to legal resources. And also, a lot of them probably just didn't know. Their descendants then inherited this land without a clear title. And it thereby became designated as heirs' property, which is a legal loophole, allowing heirs' property, although heirs' property exists in many regions of the country, it's most prevalent in low-income communities. In the South, according to one estimate, more than 50% of heirs' property owners are African-American. In the South, according to one estimate, more than 50% of heirs' property owners are African-American, many of them the descendants of slaves and sharecroppers. The Center for Heirs' Property Preservation, based in Charleston County, South Carolina, estimates that there are 105,000 acres of heirs' property in its 15-county service area alone. The property that we own was prime property. Over time, it's been sold and traded and stolen, said Alex Brown, who's a Gullah uh, native, Gullah Geechee native. Okay, you gotta, you gotta check out this article from The Nation, man. This is deep. This all deals with policy, politics, law. So this, this is a law that has to change. This, this, that land has to be preserved. Okay, that land has to be preserved. Check out this article from thenation.com. Uh, African-Americans have lost untold acres of land over uh, the last century. Okay, this is by Leah Douglas uh, from thenation.com. This is from June of 2017. This is a year ago. Most people don't even know about this. This article came out a year ago. But then it ties into the story that came out on July 10th and July 11th that we talked about in the beginning about the African-American farmers saying that they were deliberately sold fake seeds and a scheme to steal their land. This is, this is all connected, okay? This is all connected. This is all tied together. Now, with the Poor People's Campaign, all right, of 67 and 68, Dr. King talked about the uh, need for ownership of land. Now, 1966, a lot of people don't know, Dr. King met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This is a year after Malcolm X was assassinated, February 21st, 1965. July 31st, 1963, while Malcolm is still a nation of Islam, Malcolm sends a letter to Dr. King requesting a meeting, and Malcolm is calling for a unification of civil rights leaders. He said is if, if President John F. Kennedy can meet with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the uh, uh, prime minister of Russia at the time, he said if they could put aside their major differences and meet, he said then Negro leaders should be able to uh, put aside our minor differences. And he said that we need to come together and find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. Malcolm was still in the nation of Islam. And Malcolm is calling for a unification of civil rights leaders. See, see, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people say, oh, I follow Dr. King, I follow Malcolm X. Toward the end of both of their lives, their ideologies were converging. Dr. King would sound like Malcolm, Malcolm would sound like Dr. King, especially when Malcolm goes uh, on his hajj to Mecca and he goes to other African nations, he goes to African nations, okay? 
And Malcolm gets involved in the civil rights movement. When Malcolm meets Dr. King, their one and only time when they meet, March, uh, 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 March 26, 1964, at the U.S. Senate debate for the, uh, about the Civil Rights Act, Malcolm tells Dr. King, I'm throwing all of my effort into the civil rights movement. This is after he leaves the Nation of Islam, which he officially separated March 8, 1964, earlier that month. Read the, read the article from WashingtonPost.com uh, about uh, Malcolm X and Dr. King only met one time. Read that article, uh, and they break down this history. Okay, that's from uh, WashingtonPost.com. All right. So Dr. Uh, Dr. King meets with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1966. And on page 73 of How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy. Now, this is not an attack on anybody who's white. We're dealing with, we're dealing with history. And if white people read this book, they would understand our history a whole lot more. And a lot, of this, a lot of this nonsense that exists today, and a lot of this hatred towards African Americans that exists today, a lot of that would cease because a lot of white people don't understand our history because it is purposely not taught to keep people fighting one another. So the 1% stays in power. So, um, and African Americans need to read this book also because most of us don't understand this history either. But anyway, so just before page uh, 73, just before his murder by the United States government, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King uh, has shifted his focus from a social and political agenda to the acquisition of land, okay? He, from 66 to 68, Dr. King is focusing on human rights, okay? He shifts from uh, civil rights to focus on human rights, okay? So in 1968, he spoke at a rural Mississippi church and put land uh, front and center. He put land front and center. We'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute, all right? How you all like this type of information? Dr. King said, at the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land through an act of Congress, he's talking about after slavery ends, okay? At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Farmers Home Administration, 1930. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today, many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people on bootstraps. And this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington in this campaign, we're coming to get our check. Now, this is Dr. King in 1968, dealing with the Poor People's Campaign. And one of the things that Dr. King was fighting for was a guaranteed uh, uh, monthly income for poor people. So you so check this out, pages 73 and 74 of how white people got so rich, the untold story of American white supremacy. All right. And Dr. King didn't just start focusing on economics then, because see, August 28th, 1963, when he delivered a speech at the Lincoln Memorial that we call I Have a Dream, that speech was originally called a canceled check. Because he's talking about economics in that speech. You have to go to loc.gov, which is Library of Congress's website and read the text of the I Have a Dream speech. The original name of that speech was called a cancel check. That speech was not about a dream. People have the whole history, and most of us have never read the text of the speech, okay? Most of us haven't even heard the full, the speech is almost about 17 minutes. See, every Dr. King day on the television, they, they play the last two or three minutes of it. They don't play where he's talking about fighting, you know, fighting against police brutality, fighting against racism. He said, we can't stop while the Negro in the South can't vote and the Negro in New York feels he has nothing to vote for. He talks about Negroes moving from 
a, a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. And he testing, 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 testing. 